in what I had planned not to be a series that is turning into a series. And really we've been talking about this need for all of us to be filled with or baptized in the Holy Spirit, and that is that every single one of us needs the fullness of God's Spirit working in us and through us in order to accomplish the ministries that He has called us to. And last week, the scripture that we looked at was in Acts chapter 19, And we had been mostly in the earlier chapters of Acts, but I had jumped to 19 because I had kept alluding to that scripture and thought we should go there and take a look at it. And it was the case where Apollos had gone to Corinth and Paul had gone to Ephesus. And uh, if you were here last week, I gave you a little map that showed that it sounds like one went to Bluntville and the other one went to Bluff City. But the reality was there was about a thousand miles in between these two cities. And these were long journeys that they had gone in the opposite directions, essentially. And Apollos had been in Ephesus, but then had journeyed to Corinth. And when Paul arrives in Ephesus, he meets these disciples and he says, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And in their case, they answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And I've mentioned that literally I, I have asked people. Now, I often ask people, what do you know about the Holy Spirit? Or have you been taught about the Holy Spirit? And I have asked people a question along that line and literally had them respond something very close to what was stated right here in Scripture, that I didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. And so Paul, he asked them, well, what baptism did you receive? And they said, well, John's baptism. And last week we studied the fact that Apollos was one who, who, when he was in Ephesus, he taught accurately about Jesus, but that his knowledge was limited, that he had to be taken aside so that others would inform him more completely. And what he had been teaching about was about John's baptism, which was a baptism of repentance, and he had taught accurately about Jesus. So apparently, Apollos had been exposed to the ministry of Jesus sometime, certainly before Pentecost and maybe even before the crucifixion, but that he had some word of Jesus' ministry that he was explaining. And so apparently these disciples were people who had been instructed by Apollos, and all they knew was this baptism of repentance. And so then when Paul asked them about this question, well, they wouldn't, didn't know there was a Holy Spirit, and, and Paul explained to them, look, that Paul was teaching a baptism of repentance, and he was saying, believe in the one who is to come, to believe in this Jesus, that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so it is, then the scripture continues in the next verses. It says, when they heard this, that they were baptized into the name of Jesus. And Paul laid his hands upon them, that they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They began to prophesy and speak in tongues. That they had this supernatural experience of the Spirit being unleashed or empowering them in a greater way. Now, we said before that if you accept Christ, the Spirit comes to dwell within you. And I believe these disciples were already believers so that the Spirit was within them, but they had no knowledge. And the power of the Spirit is what is being unleashed when Paul prays with them. And for any of us, this is the case, just going back to what we talked about in previous weeks, that I believe the disciples were clearly already believers by the time of Pentecost. And they had already received the Spirit, according to John 20, where Jesus said to them, receive the Spirit, that he breathed upon them. But what happened at Pentecost was the Holy Spirit who dwelled within them now was being unleashed in power, that the power of God was coming upon them to anoint them and empower them for ministry. And you see, this is the same need that every single one of us has. In fact, during the last few weeks, you may have been asking the question along the lines of, why does this matter to me? That I'm just trying to make a living or raise my family or stay off drugs or get my life straightened out or something. And this whole emphasis upon being filled with or baptized in the Spirit and and being anointed for God's ministry, you think, that's, that's sort of foreign to me. But as I've said before, and I've tried to emphasize many times, every single one of us here, if we are Christians, we are in full-time ministry by definition. 
that they're not just certain clergy or other people paid to do ministry, but that if you know Christ, then you are called into ministry. And your ministry is the sphere of influence that God has given you for this season of life. For example, early, fairly early in my Christian life, I was in a church where I just volunteered in the youth ministry. Now, in that church, there wasn't a paid youth pastor. And there were a number of volunteers and some people who are part of the staff who try to do things there. But essentially, I just volunteered. And what I did not realize at the time was that God was training me and allowing me to, well, he was allowing me to minister to others at the same time he was training me for things subsequent. And you see, whatever area you are in at this season of life is the place where you are to minister, just like I was with younger people in those days. And in doing that, he is using you to minister to those folks, but he is also training you for the ministry that he has ahead of you as well. And yet in every ministry, regardless of what it is, you need the Holy Spirit as much as Peter did on the day of Pentecost. Because your ministry might be that of a stay-at-home mom with three children or five or 15, whatever it might be. You know, John Wesley, I think his mom had, was it 16 children? And uh, when she would pray, she would pull her apron up over her head, which told the children to leave her alone, that she was talking to God. I dare say with that many kids, she did it a lot, don't you think? But you might be a stay-at-home mom, and you need the wisdom and anointing of the Spirit as much as an evangelist. In order to raise those children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Or you might be someone who's in a service job. And you need wisdom in how to relate to people. Sometimes people who are ones who are cantankerous and difficult. And they lack thanks for what's going on in their lives. Or you might be in the medical profession or a teacher. Whatever it might be, every single one of us needs the fullness of the Spirit in terms of His wisdom, His anointing to minister to others. In fact, you might be in a very difficult work situation. That is, that there might be people that you have to deal with that are are very difficult And you think, boy, I'd like to get out of this job and move on to something else. Be moved to another department or promoted something or whatever it might be. Change companies. And the reality is maybe God has you right in that place because you are the person who can be the vessel, the conduit to minister to those folks. I mentioned um, that a couple weeks ago I did a funeral for a dear friend of mine, someone who was clearly filled with the Spirit and just loved the Lord. And most of his life, he worked in a manufacturing company in essentially what we would call a blue-collar job. And as I was told, during his time working there, over 200 people came to know Christ through his work in that manufacturing plant. Now, he was about doing his job, but he was more about doing his ministry in the lives of the people that God had put in his path. And all of us have that need. Now... This week, I want to elaborate on that concept, and we're still in Acts, and I want to go to Acts chapter 6. And the reason I want to go there is because, really, this particular scripture, I think, declares clearly why every single one of us needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to accomplish what God has set before us. So it is, then in this scripture it says that uh, the number of disciples were increasing. Now, this is in Jerusalem and around that area. And it says that the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Okay? Now, we got to dig into that a little bit to see, well, what in the world are they talking about? First of all, what is the difference between the Grecian Jews and the Hebraic Jews? Well, obviously, the Grecian Jews were those who what? They had a Greek background. They probably spoke Greek. Some of you have a version of the Bible that says they were Hellenistic Jews. Well, Hellene refers to Greek. And so they were people who had a Greek background, and the Hebraic Jews would have been those who spoke Hebrew or Aramaic, 
So essentially here, you had two different groups of people, both of which are Jews, but they have different ethnic backgrounds. It'd be sort of like people from Alabama and people from Tennessee, right? They're both Southerners, but they might have their squabbles over certain issues, right? And so that's what's going on here. It says that the Grecian Jews are complaining against the Hebraic Jews and saying that their widows are being overlooked. Now, we've got to understand, well, what in the world is the issue about the widows? If you go back to the Old Testament and the tithe, one of the, person, uh, the purposes of the tithe was to do what? Was to provide for the widows, for those who could not take care of themselves. Now, the retirement system in the Old Testament and essentially throughout history has been what? We didn't have Social Security. We didn't have 401Ks and so forth. The retirement system throughout history has been family, particularly children that would take care of you. And in those days, now if there was a widow though who was alone and she didn't have family really to take care of her, she could get what? She could get support from the temple or the tabernacle, if you go back far enough, or from the synagogue. In other words, part of the tithe was set aside to take care of the widows who couldn't provide for themselves. Now, it says that these are Jews, so these widows would have been receiving help from the temple along that line. But now, we could probably assume the fact that they have converted to Christianity probably means that they're not able to continue to go to the temple for support. Either because they are afraid to go there, afraid of persecution, or perhaps because they have been told that they're not welcome there anymore since they've converted to this thing called Christianity. And so what is going on is that the Christians themselves are taking up that role of meeting the needs of others, particularly the widows, but it says that what? that the Alabama Jews are complaining against the Tennessee Jews because they are not taking care of the widows properly. Can't you imagine such a thing going on? And so now, in order to understand this a little bit better and to come back and, and understand it clearly, let's skip to uh, chapter 4 of Acts, okay? Because this explains basically what was going on that led up to this. It says, all of the believers were in one heart and one mind, that they did not claim that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything. And it says that with great power, the apostles continued to testify about the resurrection of Christ, and that there were no needy persons among them, even from time to time. Some of the people who owned houses or land or whatever it might be, they would go and sell those, and then they would lay the proceeds at the apostles' feet so they could distribute whatever they had to those who had need. So basically what's going on is these group of Christians. Now, you got to think in terms of their challenge was great because their opposition was strong, whether it was from the Romans or from the Jews who had not converted like the high priest and others. There was still persecution all around them. In fact, you were, we're going to talk about Stephen, and Stephen is stoned to death shortly after this in the story. And so the fact is that it is a difficult time they have come to know Christ. Their conversion is genuine. They're filled with the Spirit and walking with one another. And they're, they're a close-knit group taking care of each other. And so it is that they don't have needs because they are loving one another. Now, I want to take a little tangent while we're on this scripture, and then I'll come back to what I was talking about. Because it is that this particular tangent here gives rise, I mean, this particular scripture gives rise to a theology that is troublesome. Some of you may have heard of something called liberation theology. And liberation theology is largely about uh, oppressed groups of people being liberated from their bondage, not by the shed blood of Christ, but by the works of governments or other organizations to help them find freedom from their economic oppression or whatever it might be. And people who espouse liberation theology use this scripture uh, to support what they're talking about. And they'll, they'll say even liberation theology is, has been, had a history of being very close to communistic parties. That there have been priests and rabbis and others, well not rabbis, but priests and others who 
supported this whole concept of uh, communism because they said it was so close to liberation theology that that a communistic system somehow would be superior because the state would own all the property, it would be distributed equally, and then everybody would benefit. But we know that communistic systems have failed because what? Because it assumes that everybody has these true motives to take care of one another, and it fails to recognize the self-centered nature of people. And no matter what system you have, you're going to have those who take advantage of others. And yet people would use this scripture to say, well, it's good for the state to own property and not individuals. But do you realize that the scripture itself protects the idea of private property? Where does it do so? Where? Well, straight back to the Ten Commandments. When the scripture says you are not to steal from your neighbor, it means what? That that neighbor has a right to own that property. You are not to covet the things of your neighbor. That there is this concept that God has allowed each individual to work and to take ownership of things. And to, to steal from another is to rob them of what is their private possession. And see, it's not the case here that they gave up possession. They are still the owners. What are they doing? They are willfully and generously giving out of their resources to meet the needs of others. They're not being coerced by a government or anything of that nature. They are doing so willfully. And really, every Christian in any setting, regardless of the economic system, should be doing the same thing. So now, I, while we were there, I couldn't help but take a little jaunt down that road because liberation theology is troublesome. I've encountered it in different places, and, and it is troublesome if you run into it because people will use Scripture to support ideologies that I think are not sound biblically. But now let's go back to where we were with this idea of what's going on in chapter 6. So it says that the 12 gathered all of the disciples. Now the 12 would be who? Well, the 11 who were primarily the ones with Jesus, plus Matthias, who's been added to replace Judas. And then there are all these other disciples who have been added to their number. And it says, it would not be right for us. Now, these are the 12 saying, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, that's a bit of a strange scripture when you think about it. What are they talking about, waiting on tables? Do they have like the disciples' roadhouse restaurant or what is it? Um, but the reality is they're talking about this daily distribution of food to the widows that essentially they have tables where they're doing this. And they say that it would not be right for us to neglect the evangelistic work and the ministry of preaching the gospel in order to wait on tables. Now, if you read that sort of too quickly and don't understand the whole context, it sounds a bit arrogant, doesn't it? Like, hey, we are the 12, and who are we to wait on tables? But that is not at all what they are saying. In fact, they're saying something here that all of us should recognize and understand. They're saying that what? Our primary ministry, our calling, our responsibility is to minister the word, to preach the truth about Christ. That Jesus had walked with them, he had taught them, and he, they had had this face-to-face -face journey with Jesus, and they were called then to tell the truth to the masses. And they were saying, they weren't discounting waiting on tables, but they were saying, our primary calling is here. This is our most important responsibility. Now look, there is a principle there that is applicable to every single one of us. Because in this world, I think one of the things that happens is that for many Christians, they say yes to too many things, they become burdened and weighed down and stressed out, and they are not then able to do the primary things that God is calling them to do. They're not able to do those things effectively. And all of us, from time to time, sort of need to sift our priorities. In other words, am I focusing upon the things that are most important? And am I allowing other people to take care of things that, 
They might be good things, but they are not the things that I'm called to do. And let me tell you, this is, a, this is a primary issue for me all of the time. Because by nature, I, I have tended to be a workaholic in the past. So if I see something that needs to be done, I'll try to take care of it. And yet in, the, in this church, look, in a church of 200 people, one pastor cannot minister to all of the people. In fact, churches expect them to, to, to do so, and that's why they burn out so quickly. But it's certainly in a church this size, it's impossible. There are people here called to do various things, whether it's ministering in the hospitals or in some other place. And I can't possibly do all of those things. I must remember, what is it that God has focused me to do that I must pay most attention to? And partly, if you try to do everything, you are robbing some people of the blessing and the opportunity that God wants to give them. And you're also draining yourself to the point you cannot continue. But you see, for every single one of us in life, is this not an ongoing issue that you must examine? That you don't allow yourself to get diverted away from the things that are most important at this stage of life. For example, I know a mother, or actually a lady who, um, before she became a mother, she participated in the symphony. She was a musician. And she enjoyed doing that. That was a passion of hers, a joy of hers. But then she became a mother, and as her children came along, she came to the place that she had to say, I don't have the time to continue with this thing that I love. And you see, for a season, now maybe that would have come back at some other time, but for a season she had to step away in order to focus on what was a higher priority. And that's a pretty simple example, but for all of us, aren't there things like that? Things that you might enjoy doing, godly things even, that at a time you may have to say, I can't continue there. And see, sometimes that is with Good, godly things. In fact, a lot of the time in churches, there's this sort of sense of guilt. If I don't do whatever it is that they've asked me to do, then somehow I'm disappointing God. Well, A, we try not to ask people too much. We try to get hope that you will volunteer to do something rather than trying to force you. But B, the real question is not whether somebody else asks you, is God calling you to do that specific thing? I mean, I'll give you another example. I get invited a lot to speak at places, like go to chapel services at schools or things like that. And, you know, almost all of those things I would like to say yes. But probably 90%, probably 80% of them I say no. Because I simply, there's only one of me. And I can only say yes to the things that are of greatest importance. So while we're there, I would encourage you to take some time sifting where you are in life. And are there some things that, I need to, that you need to say, no, another time. Because I need to focus on that which is most important. So anyway, they continued with this. And they come to a decision. Now, I bring back up Acts chapter 2 here because we talked about this a few weeks ago. And I do so because in that scripture at Pentecost, when the, script, the Spirit was being poured out, and they quoted this passage from Joel, it says that even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. And I emphasize the word servants because all of the people in these passages that we're talking about here, and all of us, that, for that matter, who are Christians, all of us are called to be servants. Whether you're a servant as an evangelist, as some of these folks are, or you're a servant in some other role, all of us are servants. In fact, Jesus said about himself, what? That he came not to be served, but to serve. That in order to follow his footsteps, all of us are taking the roles of servants. And so, in their solution, they said this. They said, Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. 
And we will turn this responsibility, that is the responsibility of distributing food, over to them so that we might give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. Now, think this through just a bit. These are people who are going to do what? They're going to wait on tables, is what the scripture says. And yet they say, choose seven men who are what? Known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. Now, I find that a most extraordinary statement. That here are people who are going to take over the role of a, in a servant's role of distributing food. And they need to be full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom in order to be appointed for this responsibility. And see, it goes back to this idea that no matter where you are in life, no matter what you are called to do, whether you're called to be an evangelist like Peter or you're called to wait on tables like Stephen's going to be one of these folks, then each of us needs to be full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. Now, they probably needed wisdom because what? That there were these complaints and so forth, and they needed to know how to work with wisdom in relating to each person, those who are complaining and so forth. In fact, um, I was in Walmart one time uh, within the last year or two, and I was checking out, and over about two registers away, there was this man who I had noticed him walk up there. He was very disheveled in his appearance and, and just... Uh, looked like he was not having the best of days to begin with. And I don't know, I figured it out later, but at the time I didn't know what it was the cause. But apparently this man was buying something like cigarettes, and the lady, an older lady who was running the cash register, asked for his ID. And he went off. Like, you could have heard him within 50 yards of that register. And he didn't stop. And there was nobody else much around there. And I honestly was heading in that direction because I thought somebody's going to have to intervene for this lady. And uh, he just kept going on and on. And, and I didn't get super close to him. I was heading in that direction. But I think he saw me out of the corner of his eye and he just stormed out of the, build, out of the whole building. And... Uh, now, that lady, she was very calm, and she had dealt with him with wisdom. He, hadn't, he had terribly overreacted. And I, I started praying for her. I said, ma'am, I just pray that the Spirit of the Lord would just protect you and, and that that wouldn't rest upon you, that you would just have peace. And she says, oh, honey, don't worry about it. I have that all the time. <laughs> now, I, I, I dare say that lady was full of the Spirit. In other words, to do her job, she needed to be full of the Spirit and full of wisdom because she's going to deal with some people. And I gather, I, I gather there's some people that when you ask them for an ID, they get irate about that, maybe because they don't have one or whatever it might be. But, um, see, she needed wisdom. Is there a place in life, a duty to which you are called, that you do not need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit? I mean, if you're a mom... You need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. If you are working a retail store, you need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. You, you might be a construction person and you're at a place where you're trying to figure something out and you don't know how to do it. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit can give you wisdom about how to accomplish the task that you're trying to do. And the point to me here is clear that every single one of us needs to be baptized in, filled with the Holy Spirit, have an anointing of Him, His wisdom to carry out everything that we are called to do in this world. So, it says that this proposal pleased the whole group, which is an oddity that everybody would be happy, don't you think? It says that it pleased the whole group. And they, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. I mean, he's, this is a guy just overflowing in the Spirit, and they're saying he's a good guy to wait on tables. And, of course, we know, we'll, we'll study later, that Stephen lost his life because he was so full of his faith. And it, it says that they selected these other people here, Philip and Procurus and so on. There is an interesting thing about those names, though. If you do a little research about every one of those names in that list, the seven, they are all Greek names. Now, what does that tell you? 
Well, remember the conflict? It was between the Grecian Jews and the Hebraic Jews. And the complainers were the Grecian Jews. Now, it is possible that some Hebraic Jews had a Greek name. That is possible. But for all seven of them to have Greek names, it appears that what they said is, you guys who are complaining, you pick out seven people to do it, which is a great philosophy. We like to apply that philosophy around here. If you have a complaint, and you, in other words, if you are anointed to complain, that means that you have the discernment and wisdom to identify the problem. And you need, to have, you need to have the discernment and wisdom to identify the solution. You are the solution. I mean, really. In the typical church, if there's a problem, what do you do with it? Take it to somebody on the staff, probably the poor little pastor. And that means what? There to fix it. But maybe you're anointed to fix it. This is true. Just a few weeks ago, somebody came running to me in the lobby. Now, they did the right thing. I'm not saying they were complaining. They were saying, there's a big problem in the ladies' bathroom. The toilet's overflowing. It's a, you know, which I'm sure in the ladies' bathroom, that is a catastrophe, right? And they were like, we don't know what to do with it. It wasn't that they didn't want to fix it. They would have. They just didn't know what to do and who to talk to. And I said, oh, let me, let me catch somebody. I knew two or three people who were here who work on the staff in some form or another who might be able to deal with it. I got to one of them. I told him about it, and it was already fixed. He and somebody else had already been in there, already taken care of it. I'm like, that's the way it should work. You know, those who had knowledge took responsibility instead of trying to lay it off on somebody else. And so in this case, it appears that those who were complaining, that they're the ones who then are called to fulfill the responsibility. Everybody's happy about it. It says then that as a consequence... That uh, now, now, get this part too. This is amazing to me. It says that they presented these seven men to the apostles to wait on tables, remember? And so what did they do with them? It says that they laid hands on them and prayed for them to anoint them to do what? Wait on tables. Think about that. They didn't see this as an inferior role or anything like that. In fact, they recognize that no matter what duty you are called to, that you need the commissioning and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. It's like Moses commissioning Joshua or any of the circumstances in Scripture where people are laying on hands. It's, it's really empowering, commissioning. And in this case, the apostles are praying for them to wait on tables. It said the consequence was that the word of God spread because what? Because those who were called to be evangelists were focusing upon their ministry and doing so. It says that the number of disciples increased rapidly. And I highlighted the part about even there were a number of priests who were becoming obedient to the faith. Now that probably wasn't the high priest because there are different levels of people who were referred to as priests in those days. But still, these are Jewish priests who are coming to Faith in Christ. But now, if the apostles had bogged themselves down in the waiting on of tables, then the ministry would not have been expanding to the level that it was. Instead, they chose people with wisdom who were full of the Holy Spirit, laid hands upon them, and commissioned them to do the job of waiting on tables so that everybody could fulfill their responsibilities. And you see, to me, there's a very, very clear principle here that every single one of us absolutely and completely needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to accomplish the things that God has set before us. And we are all at different seasons of life. In other words, you might be a teenager in a high school and you need to be Spirit-filled in order to minister to the, your peers. You might be someone who goes and visits nursing homes and you need to be anointed with the Spirit to fulfill your responsibility there. You might have an elderly parent and you spend most of your time taking care of them and you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to love them as Christ would love them. 
You see, there is no place, there are none of us who could say this is an optional thing. See, as we've been talking about this, I would assume that for some of you there's an excitement, and for some of you there's a fear, and for a number of you there's this question mark of, I'm just not sure about all this. But you see, I would say that it's not really an option if you're going to walk with Christ and really fulfill the best that he has for you in this life. It's not really an option to say, I don't want this. The only option there really is to say, I don't want to go on the path that Christ wants me to go on. And you can resist that. But if you want to fulfill what he has called you to in this life, you must have a heart that is open. Lord, fill me new and fresh and overflowing in your spirit. Now, what are we going to do to close? By the way, let me mention this to you. We're trying not to do announcements as a part of the service, so it's important that you pay attention to what's in the program, the things there, because there are a lot of good things going on here. And also, there'll be more things that are out in the lobby. There's some things today out there, like financial peace, that you need to check out because there are things that are important to you, and we want you to be involved. But we want to focus more on ministry things within the service. So what I'm going to do is ask the people who are elders and prayer team members if they'll come on to the front now. And Olivia's going to come, just lead us in a time of worship. If you want us to pray with you, just come and we'll be happy to pray with you. You can stay around and just have a heart of worship if you want. 